All right, so this uh, discussion goes into uh, some code at some point. So if you're a developer, you need to be um, listening carefully. And if you're not a developer, I will try to kind of like under uh, explain as much as I can uh, about what's going on on a high level. And it, it won't be complex, so it will be very simple. Um, and yeah, so this talk is basically about uh, Gelato and what you can do with it. Gelato being Web3's automation protocol, which um, enables developers or also non-developers, everyone basically to automate certain aspects of their decentralized applications, more specifically their smart contracts. So you can kind of like create these automated processes, these conditional processes within your application. And I will go into a couple of uh, examples how this looks like and how you can use it and build yourself with a, a small demo at the end, uh, but also just talking a bit about examples of how other projects on Avalanche uh, or on other networks like BSC or Ethereum are using Gelato today and what cool things you can build with it. And I think uh, uh, Luis is also Gelato, he will have a panel discussion tomorrow where he might talk a bit more about like vision and, and stuff like that, uh, stuff like that. And this is more really, um, product focus here and then what and why you need something like gelato why it actually makes sense and then what cool things you can build with this so the talk is called how to automate your dap and it's really just about um, helping developers to streamline their processes or also just anyone to automate certain aspects of smart contracts that you are building yourself or that you are interacting with it doesn't have to be a smart contract that you wrote for example all right so and as a Quick example, this is lagging like a couple of seconds, but this is fine. Um, let's imagine we have the smart contract. You don't need to understand the code, but basically what it does is imagine you're a parent and you have a couple of children and every time, every day at lunchtime, you want to send them, I don't know, $5 so they can buy themselves some lunch. You don't want to send everything at once because otherwise they go out and just buy candy and go crazy, right? So you want them, want to send them $5 every day at noon, for example, um, but obviously like in the future, this will all be done by smart contracts. Uh, there, there will probably no, not be some sort of bank transfer that you set up. It will just be done uh, and transferred directly into their wallet and kind of like how would you do, how could you do that without having to kind of like stand there on your phone and set an alert and kind of like click the button every, every day at lunch day, right? This sounds quite annoying. So we can imagine there's the smart contract, there's this function and this function has a list of all your children and it will transfer the money at noon to all your children at noon. Um, but yeah, you don't want to do it and call it every day yourself. You want to automate it. So someone else calls it on your behalf every day at noon. And this sounds like a very trivial thing if you think about it, but uh, actually this is not that easy uh, in Web3 or smart contract la land or just like if you develop on Avalanche specifically because smart contracts are not smart, they're quite dumb and they're very lazy actually. The only thing they do is they have some sort of logic defined and then they store certain state. Uh, and that logic that are these functions that you see in these smart contracts, they define how the state within it can be altered, right? So there are certain rules encoded and they define what, for example, the, the balance of how much your children can receive every day, how that can change. But um, actually executing that logic or actually ex executing that function has to be done by an external party that is not a, like a smart contract or something. It has to be done from someone externally to the system. And it's usually yourself, your wallet, your private key that signs the transaction, sends it to the network and hopes that it will get mined in time. And if you don't send the transaction to pay your children every day at lunchtime, they won't receive any money and they will probably be very hungry and angry with you. So um, what is understand what I wanted to kind of like note here is that smart contracts, they don't self execute magically just because you want them to execute. Um, if you want to execute smart contracts like conditionally or recurringly at some point in the future, you need to either build up like a whole own system that does it yourself or you need to use something like Gelato that actually helps you to facilitate that. And if you think about like the, the parallels in Web2, you for example have cron jobs, which some of you who are developers might know. Uh, you can set these up. These are like recurring tasks that happen on your Linux machine, for example. 
um, that, for example, scan the system for malware every 12 hours, so to say, or if you think about more like Web2 and, 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 and um, applications, um, software as a service, for example, there uh, you have these cloud-based job schedulers. And for example, you, maybe you build a system and you want to notify your users about something every 12 hours, right? And obviously you don't want to kind of like send that message yourself or like an email every 12 hours, right? But you don't want to do it manually. You want to automate the process. And usually what you have to do is you have to combine a couple of technologies like AWS CloudWatch, Lambda, uh, some APIs, and then you can send some sort of information to your users on a recurring or conditional basis. Um, and it turns out that you can actually use all of these sort of legacy technologies and build your own Web3 job scheduling service from scratch. Um, and this is kind of like what I show you right now. But it turns out this is actually sounds maybe quite easier at the beginning, but there are a lot of small things that you need to take into account when doing that. And the most important thing is when you are thinking about building your own application, for example, at some point, and you want to go beyond sending money to your children at lunchtime every day to something maybe more mission critical where you are liquidating underwater loans uh, when price drops below a certain threshold, or if you need to execute $1 million worth of an order on a decentralized exchange at the right time, then you need a system that can reliably track what's going on and gets ex get these transactions mined, right? So if you would like to build something yourself using like AWS CloudWatch, some database RBC providers, and something like Lambda that lets you event like uh, uh, execute some APIs, for example, based on events, you need to kind of like build all of these sort of components that I mentioned here at the top yourself from scratch. You need to have a system that listens to events that are emitted block by block on a network like Avalanche, for example. You need to have some logic defined that checks if the transaction that you might want to execute actually can get executed right at that time. You need to have like a balance on your uh, account, on your wallet that you have somewhere in the cloud, which is dangerous by itself. Uh, and you need to kind of like monitor that balance because let's say you run out of uh, some AVAX in your account and you can't get that transaction mined anymore, right? Because you have to pay for gas, obviously, which won't be working if you don't have any balance. Um, then, yeah, some, some networks uh, have the problem of reorgs that might happen if they don't have finality. Um, and uh, yeah, there are all sorts of smaller things like you need to simulate your transaction, whether it reverts or not. Then RPCs, especially on like faster blockchains like Avalanche, are sometimes problematic because a lot of people try to communicate with the same endpoint at the same time. And sometimes not, mes not all the messages get broadcasted. Sometimes RPCs, which are the connection between you and the blockchain, are unreliable. And if you can't communicate, can't read or can't write to the blockchain, you are in big trouble if your loan should be liquidated or not liquidated at a certain time, right? Um, and then I guess some of you might be building on Avalanche, but if you build a decentralized application today, you think about multi-chain, right? You think about different networks. You might start here, but you really have to think holistically. And yeah, you would have to kind of build up and run and maintain the system on all these different networks. Um, then like you have to define gas prices at the right time. And, and then what's very important is you have to always resubmit transactions to get the mined reliably, because sometimes when the demand for getting into block is very high, your transaction might be stuck. Uh, there might be like 10,000 different transactions waiting in line beforehand, but your transaction maybe is worth $100,000 because you are executing their liquidation right now and you can't get in. That sucks. So you need to resubmit it. You need to enter in certain sort of auction schemes. Um, and then, yeah, there's this whole point about private key management. You shouldn't just put it in the cloud somewhere, uh, but there's like another rabbit hole to enter. And this is kind of like where you could just build everything yourself or there is this uh, protocol that we built, which is sort of like this middleware layer underneath all these Web3 uh, or at the moment EVM-based compatible blockchains, but soon also non-EVM-based compatible blockchains like StarkNet, for example. Um, and uh, this is called Gelado. And Gelado is Web3's automation protocol and it basically has basically all of that in one client and it provides you with this decentralized network of operators where you as a, a human being or just a developer or whoever can go and say, hey, could you, Gelato, please watch the price on uh, Trader Joe for me? And if the price of AVAX to die on Trader Joe exceeds, 
I don't know how, how much dollars it's worth today, but increases by 20% from where it's today, please execute that trade for me, right? And only then, please, right? And so this is the stuff you can build um, on top of Gelato. And it's, Gelato consists of kind of like this off-chain component, which is the client that we build, and then the on-chain component, which lives, for example, on Avalanche. And the on-chain component are basically a central smart contract, which is this job scheduler, and this is just like a hub where you say, hey, I want, to, I want Gelato to monitor this condition for me, and once this condition is defined, I want Gelato to execute that transaction on my behalf. Um, this sort of condition part you define in what's called a resolver. I will show you in a bit how a resolver looks like. And then the target smart contract is basically the smart contract that defines what you want to do, that defines the action you want to take. And this, for example, could be execute that limit order for me on Trader Joe, or yeah, uh, refinance my loan from this protocol to the other if the interest rates uh, are suddenly more um, beneficial here for me, right? This whole um, on-chain system communicates with the client based on like this layer in between, which is this JSON RPC aggregation layer. Uh, and basically what we do is we, we, we try to have as many paths as possible to communicate with the clients uh, of uh, these different networks to make sure you, we can always read and we can always write to the network. So if a condition is met, you as a developer or your transaction knows about it right at that time. And if you need to get a transaction mined, it gets mined right now or as soon as possible. And then on the back, back end side, basically these are the clients that these Gelato executors are running that are accepting your task and that are then executing them. And they consist of like an event listener. And this event listener is basically the entry point where you where they listen to these new tasks coming in. And then there's this checker part. And this checker part is basically just like constantly checking whether this sort of task that you gave Gelato can be executed. For example, hey, is the price like the developer defined on Trader Joe? Can I now execute it or can I not execute it right now? Right? And if it can't execute it, then it won't execute it. But if it can, it will. Um, and then the execution part is basically this engine that just makes sure transactions get mined reliably. And this is actually <laughs> quite harder than it sounds, um, especially if you think about not executing one or two transactions, but tens of thousands of transactions every day and getting them mined reliably. It's uh, not easy, especially in high congestion times or sometimes when networks might be not as lively as they should, which happens. Um, and yeah, so there are a bunch of benefits. Um, the biggest one for me is this kind of like notion of that you don't need to host anything yourself. Uh, if you think about you are a developer, let's say you want to build an application that requires certain operations to be automated. You come in there and you say, hey, I've built this decentralized application. It's fully permissionless. I can't change it. It runs forever on Avalanche, on Ethereum or whatever. But actually, if it requires these sort of automated operations in the background that actually make it work, then if you are the only one that are running the server that automates these functionalities, then your app is super centralized. It just needs your quota on AWS just needs to expire or your system has a bug, then this function is not executed anymore and maybe you have a lending protocol and suddenly liquidations don't happen or you are an algorithmic stable coin and you're not rebasing your currency uh, appropriately every eight hours, right? And then the whole system collapses. So yeah, that's why rather than kind of like building up yourself and being the only one running it, Actually, having Gelato take care of that, which is an already distributed system, makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, so it's just uh, very reliable. It, 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 it handles all sorts of edge cases. Uh, you have to not think about deploying it uh, and building this infrastructure multi-chain. It's already multi-chain by default. And you don't have to worry about private key management in the cloud and stuff like that. It's nasty. And uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about building this decentralized network that automates these functionalities, which is always difficult because you need to coordinate these people because if all of them try to execute certain transactions at the same time, one of them will succeed, five of them will fail, they will revert, they will have costs and no benefits, and this will this eventually always leads into centralization again. So you want some sort of coordination layer that coordinates these, these operators. And yeah, so this is just like a flex slide uh, of, all the, of all the protocols that uh, are using Gelato in one way or another. Um, and yeah, there, there are a bunch of them out there for a variety of use cases. Um, and yeah, we hope that, of course, more from more projects from the Avalanche community are joining us soon. 
uh, we got Pangolin on there and stuff, and uh, I think that there, there, there will be more hopefully in the, in the upcoming future, but this is just like a, a slide for you to have a look. And what we will do now is we will actually show you, I will, I will walk you through how to actually do that um, yourself, how you can actually automate certain smart contracts, and you can actually do it without having to write a single line of code. You can just do it yourself, and I will show you how. Um, and then I will go into a bit of code as well to show you um, how you can do it in a more sophisticated manner if you're, for example, uh, building your own application. Cool. Let's switch. What's the time? Got 15 minutes. Perfect. All righty. So let's pretend that there's the smart contract, right? And this is an NFT. You probably all know NFTs, right? Um, and this NFT is a special NFT because it is an ice cream NFT. It's basically an ice cream, and uh, this ice cream, actually, I think there might be an image of an ice cream somewhere which I can find. Otherwise, here maybe. Um, or maybe it's not displayed here. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, so to just imagine it's an ice cream. Uh, you can uh, we can actually check it on the OpenSea, but I, I won't bother right now. Um, and this ice cream, it has three ice cream scoops on top. It's actually if you if you plug this address into OpenSea, what you should see is it's an ice cream with three scoops on top of each other. And this ice cream NFT has a special function. It's not a regular NFT. It's actually all the kind of like uh, data that uh, enables OpenSea to visualize this image for you is actually all stored on chain. It's not somewhere stored in IPFS or something. It's actually all in the, uh, in the SVGs in the smart contract itself. And what it has, it has this lick function here. And, uh, oopsie, yeah, this lick function right here. And what this lick function does is you can call this every five minutes. This is the min function, but it should, uh, this is the lick function. And this function you can actually call um, to lick the ice cream, and every time you lick it, one scoop of this ice cream will disappear. And actually, on OpenSea, the image will render differently and stuff. And this is the, like we have a tutorial on the on the on app .gelato network, and you can try it out, and you will see it. Um, but uh, this lick function has a caveat that you can only call it every five minutes because if you lick your ice cream too often, you get brain freeze, right? It hurts, so you shouldn't lick it too often. So you can only lick it every five minutes. But let's imagine you have this ice cream scoop, which is like 100 uh, ice cream, <laughs> ice cream cone, which has, which has like 100 ice cream scoops on top, right? You don't want to uh, spend uh, um, a whole day just clicking on licking your ice cream every five minutes. You want to automate that, right? So how you could do that, and this could be like any sort of function, right? But in this case, let's just say we want to lick ice cream. So what you can do is you can just, you have your smart contract deployed on, on, on Avalanche right here, right? So you can copy the address. What you can do, you can go to app.gelato network. This is the sort of like interface where you can automate anything you want to. And these are the networks we are supporting. It's uh, Ethereum, Polygon, Phantom, Avalanche, and all sorts of other networks. And you can click on create task. Now, what you do when you click on create task is you can enter a contract address. This is the contract address of our ice cream NFT. What it does, it actually fetches, if the contract is verified on Snowtrace, which is the block explorer of Avalanche, it will automatically spit out all of the different functionalities that this smart contract has, all the different functions. And let's say we, uh, we did so, we, um, we want to call the lick function, and the token ID of our uh, smart contract in this case is the two. This is the ice cream number two. And what we can do right here is we can define when we want to actually execute that function. And because we can only lick it every five minutes, we can um, enter five here. And every five minutes, Gelato will then go to this function, send a transaction to that function, lick the ice cream on our behalf. Um, you have to pay, obviously, for transactions. Transactions are not for free um, on, on blockchains like Avalanche or Ethereum or, or whatnot. And so you need to pay for it. And the easiest way to do it, actually, is just to kind of like deposit some money into uh, a, a sort of like gas tank that you have here. You just deposit some money in it, and then it will get deducted automatically from each transaction, sort of like a prepaid SIM card. Um, there are also other ways, if you want to get more advanced, where you can have the transaction itself have some payment logic encoded that just like sends some money to Gelato, but that's that easy. And so you can say, AVEX summit lick, 
my ice cream. And then what you can do is you can <laughs> hit create task, and then what it will do, um, or what it should do, it should um, start uh, licking uh <laughs> that ice cream on your behalf. And that's everything you have to do. And, and you can literally automate all sorts of functions with that. It's, of course, there are some limitations to that. It always depends on how the smart contract is written. Does it allow someone else to lick for you, or doesn't it allow someone else to lick on your behalf? Um, and yeah, actually, you see here this awesome NFT. Um, but yeah, so now it will just start and lick this ice cream for forever, as long as there's balance. It will just keep on licking. And so you should probably stop once you're finished with the eyes. Um, yeah, so this is like the easiest uh, example, right? But of course, there are some uh, use cases uh, which are not only time-based. They might be based on more um, complex conditions, right? And one of the largest use cases that um, developers or projects use Gelato for is actually for harvesting votes or in kind of like regular language to compound interest earned from certain, I don't know, uh, investments or, or, or products that money got deposited in, then certain rewards got farmed by these, normally they're called vaults or pools. So you, you see like a, if every time you see like a 20% APY, if you deposit a bit of DAI or UCC into a certain vault, um, usually what happens in the, in the background is that this money that you deposit into a smart contract then gets deposited into some protocol that you have no idea what it does and it will earn you a reward, but you want this reward. Let's say the reward is usually not, if you deposit UCC, it's usually not in UCC the reward. The reward might be in um, XYZ token. And what you want to do is you want to get, of course, your, your interest on the UCC you deposited and not in this random token. So you take that token that you earn every week, you, the system automatically sells it for you and then reinvests it into UCC, into your position, so your position keeps on compounding over time, right? And this, of course, requires to do compounding every so often, right? And um, this is exactly what we're going to do right now. So let's say we have this smart contract here. It's called the Vault Manager. And we have seven minutes time, so I, would, I won't go into too much detail here. But let's say you have the smart contract, which is called the Vault Manager. And what it does, it's basically just a list of different vaults. These vaults have different strategies. They invest your money somewhere. Um, and all of these vaults need to be uh, harvest it every so often in order to recompound the interest earned or the fees earned of that system into the vault again so you get that nice compounding effect over time. So you have this, you have this uh, smart contract function here, it's called harvest vault, you can pass a vault to it and then there's some code that basically does this compounding for you, okay? Um, and I took the liberty to deploy this to Avalanche, uh, sorry this is not the right contract, this is the contract and we want to automate that function, right? But of course, let's say there are 100 different vaults. What I could do now is I can go there, I can say, hey, every 30 minutes, please uh, call this function for all of these vaults. I could create 100 tasks, but this is quite tedious. So what I want to do is actually I want to create one task that automates 100 vaults. Um, and I don't want to just do it like time-based. I want to do it if the transaction fee that is needed to do the compounding of the vault is actually less than 5% of the money that I will compound in, right? Because you don't just want to compound and let's say the transaction costs you $5 and you compound $5, right? You, <laughs> there's not really like a good strategy to, to run. So you want to only compound if you actually accrued sufficient fees that make it worth sending that transaction. And so what we can do is we can write a so-called resolver smart contract. And resolver smart contracts are basically smart contracts that tell Gelato when certain transactions should be executed. And uh, if you're a developer, the only thing you sort of like have to follow as a standard interface is that you have to have this function, which is a, it doesn't even have to be a view function, it can just be a regular function. And it has to return two different uh, variables. One is a Boolean, one is a bytes, and it returns uh, true if, the, if, the, if uh, Gelato should actually execute something and it returns the data which Gelato should use to execute a certain uh, function with. And so what we can do is we have this, uh, let's say we have a list of vaults and you can, uh, in the vault manager, we have this uh, innumerable set here, which is just this nice data structure that stores a bunch of vaults with indices. And what we can do is we can iterate 
over it by getting the length of this certain uh, data structure. And uh, what we can do is we can get the various vaults um, every single time we uh, go through this for loop right here. And then we should have a helper function that tells us should this vault now be harvested or not, right? And how should we determine whether something should be harvested or recompounded? It should be worth the transaction fees, right? This is what we kind of like described at the beginning. And what we can do in this result, we can just say, all right, we tested it locally, right? And we know that this harvest or this recompounding transaction, it costs roughly, it consumes 300,000 units of gas, right? So we know that this is roughly the cost of the harvest. So what we can do is we can call the a function on this vault, which is returning the amount of fees that have been accrued in this vault that can be recompounded. And what we do is we basically check, okay, are these fees, are they larger than, or uh, is, are, uh, is basically are the fees accrued, are 5% are of these fees that have been accrued larger than what the transaction will cost us to execute. And you can get the cost of the transaction by taking the 300,000 gas units that we defined plus the gas price that Gelato is using to actually execute the transaction, right? And then if this whole helper function returns true, then all good, please execute, right? And then what we have here is we can basically say, hey, if can exact return true, please encode the harvest vault function, which is the function we have right here, right? Please uh, encode this function and we take the vault that we just checked whether we can harvest it or not on, right? And if that's the case, we break out of the loop um, and it will just return true plus the data and Gelato will know and will execute it for you on your behalf. And if not, we will return, hey, no vaults can be harvested. Um, and I've got a couple of minutes left, so let me just show you how this would work. You will go to here and this is basically the vault manager. This is the contract we want to execute the harvest vault function on, right? So we can go back to create task. We can dump this in here. Uh, unfortunately, because I'm a noob, I wasn't able to <laughs> verify this contract somehow. So I have to manually copy paste the ABI of that smart contract from here, but no problem. We can just copy it in here and then uh, the UI spits out the functions manually. Then you can define, okay, harvest vault function. This is the one we want to call, but we don't want to predefine uh, an address here. We want to dynamically generate it using this resolver that I just showed you. So the resolver are also deployed. We take the address, we dump it in here, we go in here, we get the ABI of the resolver contract as well, so we know which functions it has. We dump it in here, and it was the checker function that I showed you earlier. And that's basically it. We are again paying with the funds that we have in here, and this is basically the uh, harvest vault task. IVAC summit, and then we can click on uh, create task, and then it should create it. I don't want to create it right now, otherwise um, uh, I will pay for it. <laughs> um, and But we, what we can do is we can go here and we actually can see uh -huh, our ice cream um, should have been licked. And if, if, you, if you want to check out these transactions, they just got executed three minutes ago. So Gelato actually licked the ice cream on our behalf uh, three minutes ago and actually licked it twice already. So it will probably continue licking if I don't stop it, but I want to stop it. And yeah, the, the, the image is somehow not rendering. I don't know why, um, but I can click pause here. And now I will basically tell Gelato, hey, please stop uh, licking this ice cream for me. And then that's it, right? So it won't, it won't lick anymore. Cool. Just did that so I don't have to pay. Because sometimes you forget it and then you run out of money. Um, cool, this is kind of like what it was, just a small plug at the side. We also recently launched our Gelato multi-chain relay API. So if you're building any cool gaming applications or bridges or whatnot, and you want your users to not pay for transactions, you want to maybe provide them with the ability to have gasless transactions, so where they just sign messages and then they have transaction relayed, so they don't have to have AVAX in their accounts to actually use your application. Then uh, something like the multi-chain relay API is super cool because you can just have one API and then you can get transactions mined reliably on all different networks that you want, including Avalanche uh, and Polygon, Phantom and whatnot. And it's pretty cool and we just recently released it and I have some docs 
So definitely check it out um, uh, or text me if you want to use it or if you want to hack something this weekend, for example. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, uh, Luis will give a talk tomorrow um, about gelato in more detail. Uh, so yeah, definitely also join this. And yeah, if you have questions, just hit me up afterwards. Thanks. <laughs> questions or? Well, yeah, maybe you can also just come to the front and, and we do questions. Otherwise, if someone has a question for everyone, you can also raise your hand. Um, I think there's one gentleman or another one. Do we have some mics? Hi. Yes, I have a question regarding the... Um, the network that you built. So if you have some sort of uh, map or list so to understand uh, well, where these nodes are sitting or how distributed are they. Um, and, yeah. uh, well, and the last one is uh, yeah, now that you show the cover, um, if there is a difference between founder and legendary member, and if there's a story behind that, it would be nice if you share. Yeah, yeah no. Um, so to, for the first questions, uh, we don't have a map yet where you see like where, geog where geog geographically located nodes are. This we're actually are focusing on, on making more transparent this year. Uh, right now, they are basically just like a mapping you can check out on a smart contract, and you can check out the entry point to the system, which is uh, the Gelato Network smart contract. You can find it at docs at Gelato Network, and there. You different, basically see the different accounts that are executing these transactions. But what, what we want to build right now is basically this sort of map of who runs what and what sort of parties. Uh, right now, this is still a whitelisted process, so we work together with different operators. Uh, they run, for example, also like validators for POS networks and stuff, and they run our infrastructure as well. Um, but yeah, we at some point, we want to make it as open as everyone can just spin them up themselves. But uh, this is not the case right now. So right now, we still have some sort of coordination power there as a DAO. Um, and the legendary member, is, uh, it's a very important title <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the project, but basically legendary members are all the core team members of Gelato as a DAO, but all the core team members uh, are basically legendary members. Uh, and, you, and usually the process is you join like the community and you help and contribute in any way you can. And then at some point, if you really do a lot of good work, then you get the legendary member title and then you enter all the legendary member chats and this is and then you come to conferences like this with us and and yeah so it's kind of like the stepping stone you want to want to get to at some point yeah cool uh, sorry, I didn't quite get where is the process uh, hello yeah sorry i didn't quite get where in the process uh, is the gas, is the blockchain gas being paid? Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you use Gelato to pay for, mm -hmm. for the service, yeah. but w where is the gas being paid for? So the executors of the Gelato system, they pay for the gas. Oh, okay. And uh, I showed you when I created the task, you deposit some AVEX, for example, into uh -huh. this sort of uh, prepaid gas tank. And this gas tank gets deducted for each transaction that Gelato pays for you. So you pay for it if yeah, you want to use it, indirectly. but the gas is paid by the okay. Uh, executor. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But you can also pay in ERC20 tokens, by the way, right? So that's a cool thing. You can pay in DAI or UCC or any other token. You don't need Gelato to pay it now. Uh, two questions for my side. First, uh, so do I understand correctly that Gelato is a software as a service or there are other deployment models like uh, to get a license and install it on your premises? Um, Gelato is uh, decentralized and open network, so it's basically just a, 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 a network of operators that we built uh, and bootstrapped and then there's the smart contract which is a single open API that everyone can access. You can access this via our interface that we deployed that I showed you, or you can just interact with it with the smart contract directly. So it's completely open and you can use it. So it's, it's, it's not like a SaaS, like the interface you maybe can qualify as like a SaaS thing, but like mm -hmm. the, the whole network is uh, open and permissionless. Okay, got it. And the second question is uh, regarding the, 
the gas that is uh, supposed to be paid as you showed in the demo. Uh, do I understand correctly that uh, this is purely the fees which are required by the, for example, Avalanche network to, mm -hmm. uh, to process the transaction? Or, for example, I, I'm just thinking about use case about uh, a subnet where the tokens owned by you, let's say, by the the one who is owning that application. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, do you still need to to deposit something on, on Gelato? Or, uh, I mean, those tokens which needs to be paid for the gas are your own tokens and uh, you have all of them. Yeah. So um, you still, like, I, I would assume you would still have to... Um, relay these transactions to some valid data set, right? That mm -hmm. will then include them in the block and they will have to ask you to pay some fees to them, right? If you own all the fees, then the send or the TX origin, the EOA that actually tr sends the transaction, this is the account that will be charged for the transaction. Mm -hmm. So it will require to have some tokens or some, some AVEX on Avalanche, right? Um, and uh, that's why you have to deposit them into the smart contract and then they can pay for it. I'm like, regarding the subnets, I'm not sure what your setup is exactly, but uh, happy to discuss it afterwards. Um, but yeah, so someone has to pay for a transaction and transactions are usually not for free. Uh, and that's why Gelato basically pays for the transaction and you pay Gelato by depositing some funds in the smart contract, which then gets deducted um, based on the transaction fees of that transaction. So basically it is also possible to uh, fund or to de deposit your tokens of your subnet basically against which it will be uh, executed and not uh -huh. real money um so like we are not live on like the subnets right now at the moment we are only on avalanche so on the on the, on the, on the mainnet um and for the subnets yeah i think they are i'm not 100 percent sure how this would how this would work and with the payment and which token at the moment there's a white list of tokens basically that are accepted which include like the network tokens and then all the major stable coins mm -hmm. and then some bigger liquid tokens so not every token right now can be used to pay for these transactions so um, if you have a subnet with your own single token then um, yeah we would have to think about how this would work but usually if you just have avex then you can just pay with that and are there any, any fees on top of what you have to pay the validators of the network? Yeah, uh, so um, right now it's completely for free uh, because we're still in kind of like the bootstrapping phase, but there will basically be like a small margin of like, uh, on mainnet there's like 10% or so of the transaction fee, which is on top, which goes to the uh, executor that pays the transaction. This is the incentive for them to do the work. Thank you. Hi. Um, so my question is, who is the executor address in the end? Like if I have an only owner function in my contract and yeah. I would like Gelato to, to, to mm -hmm. do something with that, um, do I have to submit my, my private key or, yeah. or was the... So um, this is a very good question. Um, access restrictions and smart contracts is like a big thing, right? So um, what you should do or what you need to do here is I would rec or what I would recommend you to do is to have um, uh, uh, one or two whitelists of um, roles that can execute certain transactions. One, the only owner role you should kind of keep as for you or your DAO, for example. Um, and this is only the functions that don't need to be automated, but that I don't know, like the stop functions. If something is, if you discover the bug, you want to stop a function. This is where you want to have like the only owner modifier. But then you should have like an operator modifier, and there you just either whitelist the Gelato smart contract, so the message sender will actually be the smart contract of Gelato, and it's written in such a way that it's flash loan resistant, so you don't have to worry about using an only EOA modifier. You can just have like only operator modifier, and either you just have a whitelist that you can extend if you want or you just whitelist the Gelato smart contract right away and the address is in the docs and you just whitelist that and then Gelato can automate it. All right, thank you. Yeah. But have, they have different roles because otherwise it gets a bit messy. Cool, thanks guys.